So can you see my slideshow? Yeah, okay. Uh, so thanks for asking me to speak. Um, so I'm just gonna go through what briefly what is glaucoma, what the current pharmaceutical approaches to the treatment of glaucoma are, what the unmet needs are, which obviously will be uh, of relevant to, to yourselves, um, what's out there in terms of uh, drug delivery systems, what the pros and cons are, um, and a little bit at the end about uh, the unmet need with respect to glaucoma surgery, in particular uh, filtering surgery, whereby we create a little blister under the eyelid where the fluid drains. Um, and that also uh, is subject to, to failure, scarring and various other problems, but I'll touch on those as well. Um, so the quest, first question is, what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a, uh, is a condition where the intraocular pressure in the eye uh, increases. Um, and the reason it goes up, uh, it's thought is because of ex uh, excessive deposition of extracellular matrix within this very delicate tissue here, the trabecular meshwork. Um, and for the vast majority of patients, uh, it's, it, this is really quite an amazing tissue because it keeps the intraocular pressure within the eye within a range of 12 to 21 millimeters of mercury throughout the lifetime of, of the, the person. Um, the fluid in the eye is produced by the ciliary body here. This is a cross section of the eye. Uh, there's a ciliary body. This produces the fluid that nourishes the eye, uh, circulates throughout the eye and maintains the pressure within the eye. The eyeball is like a pumped up football. It needs a certain amount of pressure to keep all of the various elements uh, in alignment so that you can see. Because if you puncture the eyeball or perforate it, the eyeball collapses. So in essence, um, this area here where the fluid drains uh, is shown in high mag here. And this is where the problem is. This is this sieve-like structure becomes blocked and the pressure goes up. And that pressure within the eyeball uh, exerts um, a stress and strain on the optic nerve head, which then gets damaged and you lose vision. So um, again, this is a, a slightly higher powered view of the same a schematic. This is where the problem is. Um, the Schlem's canal, which is the drainage canal of the eye, connects to aqueous veins, which then drain into the surface blood vessels um, of the eye. Um, so you can see here the pressure in the eye is 15, the pressure here is 10. So there is a constant gradient of fluid going into the drainage system. Um, again, slightly higher power view. The problem lies in this area here. Uh, this is the ju juxtacanalicular tissue um, where uh, extracellular matrix is deposited. And this increase in extracellular matrix um, appears to increase the resistance to outflow fluid. And thus, thus the pressure has to go up to maintain the flow, which uh, is essentially the same. Um, and this is an electron uh, micrograph uh, showing a patient with uh, glaucoma. This is uh, the, the uh, histological view of the um, juxtacanalicular tissue and the inner wall endothelial cells. So you can see that there, there is this increased deposition of this electron dense material, um, which isn't present, present to normalize. And this uh, it correlates with, with intraocular pressure. And the other issue is obviously you've got, uh, you've got these distal outflow channels, which also it is now increasingly thought may play a, an important role in the resistance to outflow and disease within these channels may also be important uh, in terms of regulation of intraocular pressure and indeed aberrant uh, IOP control. And that's just, a, again, a, a cast and more a schematic of the, of, of the same. Um, and it's really quite a complex structure. And we believe now that disease within the canal itself may also be relevant. So what happens in terms of your vision? Well, this is normal vision. And as glaucoma progresses, you initially lose your peripheral vision. And then eventually, you, when you lose it, by the time you lose your central vision, or by, by the time you start to develop severe symptoms, it's actually too late. You've, you, you're, you're pretty much blind. So when we're treating glaucoma, we're treating a risk factor, and that risk factor is raised intraocular pressure. It's not the disease itself. The disease itself is the damage to the optic nerve head. And we know from various studies that lowering intraocular pressure reduces the, the risk of progression of um, ocular hypertension, which is just pressure alone without optic nerve damage, and also um, the progression of glaucoma to blindness. The problem with all of these treatments and therapies is that uh, it depends on what the pa patient's attitude to risk is. And that's quite important when you consider therapy um, and the type of delivery mechanism you use um, to deliver your therapy. So in terms of glaucoma medication, I'm just going to go briefly through the current drug classes that are out there. Um, the issue of preservatives, which are required in, in bottled glaucoma drops. 
um, and a little bit about depot therapy and then uh, some of the future perspectives that you, you may be interested in. So it's a very, very complex journey uh, a drug takes to having a therapeutic effect. So let's just go through, through some of these things. You know, you have to have the correct drug, drug, correct indication, appropriate formulation. Um, you know, there's a big issue sometimes with generic drugs, which may not have the same uh, excipients or other uh, additional um, elements to their formulation, which may affect the, uh, the bioavailability and the efficacy of the drug, correct prescription, you know, other medications, you know, a lot of, a lot of patients are on polypharmacy and that makes life difficult. So our glaucoma patients are not just taking eye drops. They're probably taking five, six, seven other drop, uh, tablets they have to take. Mental factors, social factors, physical factors, all impact on the ability to put eye drops in. Putting eye drops in is actually quite a difficult thing to do. Uh, if any of you have had, you know, conjunctivitis or other infections, you'll know it's, um, the, you know, the drop just about, about, about goes everywhere but the eye. Um, understanding the disease, the delivery mechanism, individual pharmacokinetics, pharmacogenomics are important. And then you have a therapeutic effect and that has to be balanced up against the side effects. And obviously there is the, uh, the elephant in the room, which is compliance. For any asymptomatic disease, uh, it's very hard to ensure compliance because the patient doesn't really have any symptoms. So what happens to an eye drop? You'll put the eye drop uh, into the conjunctival sac. Um, a lot of it is washed away by the, 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 tear, um, the tear production from the lacrimal gland, and it runs down into the nasal lacrimal duct into the nose. So only 10% of the drug that you place on the surface of the eye in the form of an eye drop actually penetrates the cornea. So again, very, very important factor when you're considering drug delivery into the, the eye. Um, again, you know, some of the pharmacokinetics of this, when you put a drop in the eye, it, uh, it equilibrates with the conjunctival sac and the proteins in the con conjunctival sac, and then it equilibrates with the cornea, the anterior chamber, um, and then it'll have an effect on the outflow pathways uh, in the eye. So the classes of medications that are currently available, um, a lot of these are drugs that don't actually target the underlying pathology. What they do is they, um, they suppress the production of fluid in the eye um, um, or they um, affect the, the pupil diameter. But the point about these, a lot of these drugs is that in, in some ways they might actually be exacerbating the problem by suppressing aqueous humor production in the eye. You might actually be depriving the uh, trabecular meshwork of nutrition. And sometimes you know, when we lose control of patients intraocular pressure, despite them being on medications for a long time, that may be one of the underlying mechanisms. So this is just a very brief overview of the drugs that we currently use. These are prostaglandin analogs. Um, these are the ones that we currently use. And they the way they work is by increasing flow uh, through this area here. This is called the uveoscleral pathway. It's also been shown that they do have an effect on the trabecular meshwork as well. Um, but this is the main sort of uh, um, mechanism of action through the uveoscleral pathway. So actually you're diverting the aqueous away from the trabecular meshwork, most of it. Again, that might be a problem in terms of long-term uh, disease uh, progression. Um, and they have side effects as well. You know, one of the, the sort of com uh, known side effects is it can change the color of your, your iris due to increase uh, melanogenesis. Beta blockers, these have been around for probably about 50 years now uh, and have been used for the control of intraocular pressure. Beta blockers, they're very good, but again, they are suppressing the production of aqueous humor and they have, and they have side effects. You know, it's particularly in older patients who have cardiovascular issues or asthma or other issues, you cannot use beta blockers. And they have side effects as well. You know, some of the things I've, I've mentioned there. Um, and then we have alpha agonists, another class of uh, drugs. These also have um, multiple mechanisms of action, but again, main, main uh, sort of mechanism is uh, suppression of aqueous humor production, which again can be problematic. And these drugs, again, we can't really use long-term uh, because they have side effects. Um, Aproclonidine is, is one su such drug. It's a derivative of a drug called clonidine, which used to be used for blood pressure control, but it had horrendous uh, central nervous system side effects. And even aproclonidine in some sensitive patients can have uh, central nervous system side effects as well. Um, and um, the other issue is allergy. These drugs do cause significant allergic reactions as well if you use them for a long time. Uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, again, they're useful drugs, but they can leave the patient with a bit of a metallic taste in the mouth, particularly as the drops do run down your, your nose into your nasolacrimal system. 
A couple of, uh, one of the newer drugs that is around is, uh, they're not available in the UK now at the moment, but they're called rokinase inhibitors. And this is one such drug. And this actually has um, a direct effect on the trabecular meshwork outflow pathways in that it causes relaxation of, of, of the trabecular meshwork. And that's been shown to increase aqueous outflow. This slightly older drug, pilocarpin, which is a, a, a muscarinic agonist, also has an effect on the trabecular meshwork uh, because it affects the ciliary muscle. Um, and causes ciliary muscle contraction. And we know that ciliary muscle, uh, tiny tendons from the ciliary muscle um, enter the trabecular meshwork and can affect uh, both the trabecular meshwork, but also affect the ju juxtacanalicular tissue and open up spaces within the juxtacanalicular tissue, improving outflow. And this is a drug we do occasionally use, but its biggest side effect is that it constricts the pupil right down. And so it actually affects your ability to see, and, and that can be a problem in some patients. And the other big problem with uh, drops that we give to our patients for glaucoma is a, a number of our patients end up with eyes looking like this. The eyes become very red, very sore. And, you know, in, in essence, you've got a patient who comes to you with raised pressure and a disease and a condition that isn't really giving them any symptoms. And you end up giving them symptoms from the drops that you give them. So again, if we can avoid this, this would, this would be great. And the key culprit in a lot of these, these uh, scenarios is this thing called benzalkonium chloride, which is a preservative, and it's added to the, the, um, the, the drop bottles to uh, prevent um, you know, in, infection and, and growth of bacteria and to preserve the drug. And so the problem is, however, this does cause a lot of problems like, for example, inflammation, activation of fibroblasts. And there's a lot of evidence that um, if you have more uh, benzalkonium chloride drops going into your eye, it affects the success of future surgery. So the unmet, need, un, unmet needs really are that, you know, we need drugs that target the pathophysiology of the raised pressure, the drugs that target the extracellular matrix. We need better de depot delivery systems, which have a prolonged duration of action, uh, minimal side effects, and they have to be acceptable by, by patients from the point of view of, of the risk benefit ratio. And um, I'll give you examples of some of these uh, uh, things that are out there. Uh, they're, they're not uh, available clinically yet, but they have just um, uh, are in the process of undergoing clinical trials. This is something called um, uh, an IDOS implant, um, and this has uh, Travaprost, which is one of the drugs I mentioned earlier. And the idea here is to put this implant into the drainage angle, and it sits here in the eye, and over a period of about a year, it slowly eludes the, the drug. Um, and I'll just show you a, um, a video of the implant being put in. Um, and this is the uh, this is a gonio lens which allows you to view the the drainage angle of the eye. There's the pupil, there's the iris, and there's the the angle, the trabecular meshwork. So you just go in with this uh, little um, delivery system and uh, plug the device uh, into the drainage angle, and it'll sit there for for 12 months and it'll elute um, the medic. And this is what it looks like when you have a look uh, clinically. Um, now. These drugs are effective. They're lowering the intraocular pressure. This is an eight millimeter reduction. And the main, the effect of IOP reduction seems to be maintained up to about a year, which is quite good from the patient perspective because they don't have to think about putting a, a, a drop in or anything like that. But obviously it, this is a small operation and any operation on the eye carries a very small risk of infection. So that's, you know, you have to kind of weigh that risk up with the, with the patient. This is another uh, implant that's, uh, I, I believe, available now in, in, in America. This is Bimataprost. Um, and I'll just show you what, uh, what this uh, looks like. Um, so this is, the, again, uh, an applicator, uh, the applicator which has the, the, the drug inside, uh, inside this little needle. Um, and then essentially what you do is you, um, you go into the eye. Just go forward here. So the surgeon is going into the eye, penetrating the eye with that needle. And then when you inject, uh, press on the button, this uh, drug is released into the, uh, this little pellet is released into the eye and it, um, it and there it is sitting in, in the clinic in the, in the inferior part of the angle. And this eludes uh, bimatoprost over a period of time. Uh, this um, has been licensed um, by the FDA, um, but it's only licensed for one application. So you can only give one of these uh, it lasts up to about four to six months. So I'm not sure what the, 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 uh, the benefit of having only one application will be, uh, but uh, you know, the proof of concept is there. But we do really need, we need drugs like this, we, but those that hang around for a much longer time. But the problems with these delivery systems are they are quite invasive. It is expensive. You know, these, um, 
uh, drugs in in this format, you know, they're, they're going to cost many thousand, you know, many thousand, several thousand pounds compared to a, you know a few you know a few pounds for the drops. They are potentially burdensome to deliver. Uh, they do have small but serious complications. So in appropriate patients, they might be absolutely fine. Uh, but if you could have something that you could put in the eye and it would, and it, and it would target the actual drainage pathway, the extracellular matrix, and it works for two years plus, that would be something where the patient starts to think about having something like that done um, as opposed to using drops for two or three years. Um, this is something that, that, is, that is out there. Uh, this is a paper from about two or three years ago uh, where they're using PLGA um, spheres, polyglycolic acid spheres, uh, suspended inside a gel. So the drug is contained inside these spheres. And this was a study done in, in, in rats where they uh, looked at pressure control over a month. So in essence, it's like having a monthly eye drop um, inside this gel. And what they found was that the bromonidine released over a period of time is quite a linear release, actually. So it was quite quite good in terms of the pharmacokinetics. Um, and compared to standard drops, uh, it lowered the pressure. So this was the, the bromonidine in the, um, in the spheres, and this was the eye drop that was given on a daily basis. So um, there, was, uh, there was good uh, efficacy and, and bioavailability uh, using this technique. But this is, again, very much uh, still in the, in the realms of experimental medicine. Something else uh, just for you to think about. Um, uh, I have quite a big interest in, um, in um, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. This is one of the operations that we use. And I just want to show you that this might enable us in the future, this sort of delivery system may enable us to deliver drugs directly into the canal. Um, so this is, the, this is just a, showing you what the conventional outflow pathway is from the ciliary body to the drainage system. Um, and let's just look at this. So this, um, this is the trabecular metric on FAS. Uh, and let's just go a little bit more forward. Um, and this is essentially, this is all the, the crud that's accumulating in the meshwork schematically. And so what we're going to show you here is this uh, delivery system. This is something we use to actually expand the canal. Okay, so have a look at this. So this is it's quite a neat little device. You can put, you can put a, a gel on the back of this, so the gel can be delivered through the tip of this tiny catheter. Um, and potentially in the future, we could deliver drugs like this as well. So you go in uh, with this um, little um, device, you pierce the trabecular meshwork, you, you enter the canal, um, and you pass this catheter uh, around the canal um, 180 degrees. And then as you retract the catheter, uh, the, there's a quite clever mechanism, deposits gel into the canal. And that's currently what we're using is viscoelastic gel. Uh, and that the idea is just to dilate up the canal um, and uh, open up the, the the distal drainage pathways, which does improve intraocular pressure control. But I'm fairly certain in the future we could use this to deliver drugs, uh, which could have an effect on the meshwork, but also uh, directly on the uh, distal drainage pathways uh, to improve pressure control. And this is just an example of a of, of a case. This is a, one of my patients that we operated on. A few weeks ago, um, it just gives you an idea of what it looks like uh, in, the, in the living eye. Um, so we penetrate the, the drainage canal there and then uh, pass the catheter into the canal. Um, and as it passes around, it, uh, it dilates up the, the drainage canal. Now, when you, uh, when you retract the catheter back, you can see this jelly being injected into the canal and some of the jelly is refluxing back and uh, displacing that blood that you can see. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to just mention very briefly was the problem with, so in, in some patients where the, their own drainage system uh, is damaged, we then have to bypass the fluid out of the eye uh, into the subconjunctival space. And this is an example of such an operation. Um, we open up the conjunctival tissues and then we, then we apply um, this very, uh, very strong drug called mitomycin C, which is a, a chemotherapeutic agent um, and acts as a DNA alkylating agent, causing the formation of DNA adducts. And the idea, and this, these sponges are soaked in this mitomycin C, and the idea is that they will essentially kill off all the fibroblasts in this area, because in this, what we want here is we want controlled healing. We don't want, uh, we're essentially making a little hole in the eye, so we don't want this hole to close over. In this case, we're actually using a little shunt device. So this is a this has been around for about three or four years now, um, and it's quite a nice minimally invasive way of draining the fluid from within the eye to this little blister. So you make a little cut into the wall of the eye, you pass this needle to make a little track. Um, and then once you've made that track, 
you passed a little tube uh, into the into the uh, the eyeball eyeball, and that will drain the fluid from within the eye to the to the the surface of the eye, and it'll uh, drain under this little blister that we've created here. Um, and so, as we go forward, when we close up the eye, right at the end, what you've got essentially is you've got the tube inside the eye draining the aqueous humor into this little sump that you've created. Now, the idea here is that this sump mustn't scar up. If it scars up, then fluid won't drain out of this and your pressure will go up again. So again, what do we need in terms of, in terms of uh, this sort of uh, issue? Um, we need um, the ability to modulate the wound healing process. Um, mitomycin C, uh, it, it's use you know, in glaucoma surgery, but it, it is toxic. It does have side effects and can cause tissue damage resulting in very thin walled uh, blisters, which can leak and have problems in the future. So the unmet need really here is safer alternatives. You know, mitomycin C only acts for the period that it, uh, it is applied to the tissue. Um, we need drugs that have a prolonged duration of action because even despite the mitomycin, you still get scarring uh, to improve the success of, of operations because even, even uh, the trials show that these sorts of operations have a 50% failure rate in five years. So patients end up having to have more and more, more operations to control the pressure. So we, we do really need um, something which, which improves that. So just to summarize then, uh, I think there's definitely a need for drugs with novel mechanisms of action. Um, we need better ways of delivering drugs topically, whether that's in the form of a gel um, uh, or prolonged intraocular delivery mechanisms. And we need improved antifibrotics uh, as adjuncts in glaucoma filtering surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Imran. That's a fantastic talk. Really, I think, gave people insight into all the different difficulties uh, and challenges in, in what you do. Um, I don't see any other um, questions now in the chat. Uh, one thing I think you touched on and kind of answered, but I think is, is really important for this audience is in terms of how we deliver treatments. I know you're a big fan of surgical interventions, and that, that's a lot of what you do. Um, and I, I guess the, the patients you see often have quite advanced glaucoma, quite severe disease. Where, where do you think the, the balance lies? When, when can we take a patient who essentially is asymptomatic, the only symptoms they usually have are from the eye drops we give them. Yeah. Where, where, where do you think we can take that? When do you think we can take that patient and start, start proposing something invasively? I, I, I guess monthly inj injections like we do for AMD are probably yeah. never happening in glaucoma. Where, where, where's that balance? Well, well that's interesting. Um, People who were involved in the BIMATACROSS trials, in the Durista trials, 50% of them um, said that they wouldn't have that treatment again. Now, I think, uh, as you say, acceptability by patients uh, for invasive procedures, you know, when I'm doing surgical procedures, it's usually a balance between you might lose your sight or I'll do your surgery and you'll have a small risk of going blind from the surgery. And usually there isn't a, a choice there and the patients are willing to have surgery. In, in this scenario, I think, I would, I would say that um, for more, the more invasive intraocular delivery systems, they have to have uh, shown response to topical therapy, but had, have had side effects from topical therapy. So I think if they're getting side effects, the eyes becoming quite red and you're creating those symptoms that we've talked about, um, then the patient becomes symptomatic and you're giving them an option to become uh, symptom free by having the drug injected into the eye. So I think that would be an, an option. And I think so some of these depot delivery systems would, would come in probably a second line if the patient wasn't tolerating the eye drops uh, or was tolerating them, uh, but was getting horrendous ocular surface problems. That's where I think they, they kind of fit. Uh, th thanks, Emma. Um, I think we are out of time now, but thank you very much for, for talking. Um, our next speaker is um, Professor Maria Musaji. Uh, talking on development of novel therapeutics for genetic eye disease. So thank you very much for speaking. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you, Zubair, for inviting me to speak today. I'm just going to try to share my screen. You should be able to. I've given you permission, Maria. How's that? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. So, yeah. So uh, in the next sort of 20